selected only in dimension two, about which I will talk at the very, very end of the, of the, of the talk. At the beginning, I will be trying to introduce them to the one dimensional theory, theory which is like pretty classical, uh, but uh, at the end of the presentation will be kind of more complicated with my, my collaborators in the approach. Yeah, so the plan is basically to first explain you uh, what are curves and global fields? So the idea is that I will talk not only about curves, the sort of curves you know, like over C, but also arithmetic curves. I will explain what that is. Uh, if someone was listening to my talk last year, then I was already talking about it. And then I will actually explain what are the cases. And then uh, I will talk about Fourier analysis on other spaces, which is originally due to paint. Uh, we'll present some uh, some kind of new way of, of looking at certain geometric properties or presenting set, certain geometric properties using Fourier analysis in a, in a kind of new way. And yeah, then I will walk exactly to all the characteristics in the other that exactly the properties I mentioned. And I will present in a new way. And uh, and a completely new thing will be like generalization of this approach to the two dimensional things. So, okay, so uh, I will try to be gentle. Can I ask what time I actually started? Uh, okay, so basically, um, I will try to be gentle. So, I will be kind of mostly talking about the theory just for P1s, for the geometric P1 level. Like exactly all the C and also arithmetic P1. So the function field of the geometric P1 are the geometry. The function field of the geometric will be Q, and we will call those two and uh, their finite extension global fields. So like typically, you have to be like you, you can be aware that there are also finite extensions of those as global fields, but we will mostly try to kind of just look at Q. And C of T. Uh, so basically, just to justify why arithmetic P1 can be called arithmetic P1, uh, I will just recall uh, what we call a normal field. It's just the following function uh, satisfying uh, such three uh, conditions. So we have the two normal zero. Complicative and it satisfies triangle inequality. So I think everyone uh, has seen that. Uh, and we also can divide nouns into Archimedean and not Ar non Archimedean. So the non Archimedean norms are exactly norms which uh, satisfy some stronger condition than the triangle inequality. Which is that the, the absolute value of the sum is uh, small or equal to the, the, the maximum of the norms of the two uh, components. And, and yeah, and if, if this is not satisfied, then we actually call our, our norm uh, Is that clear for the moment for everyone? Okay, great. Uh, okay so. Now, uh, I will tell what is a PM norm on the field of natural rational numbers. So we're like very down to we have just rational numbers. And we define the following norm. So basically, for each prime number, uh, the norm of, of, of uh, any rational or that periodic norm. It's just p to the minus p of a when we use like maximal multiplicity with, with which we actually divide a. So you can think it like just kind of normal division on the ring of integers, and you can extend this multiplicity uh, to the whole of rational numbers. And yeah, and that function here is, is called evaluation. 
Yeah, I, I just tell that because they may use it <laughs> subconsciously later. Also, have the norm basically the standard, the most standard norm we have ever known on rational numbers or real numbers. We actually going to denote it as a infinity, and for some reason that's uh, here a bit later, <coughs> an infinite prime. Uh, and now it's this, this, this is just not so important. So, uh, the definition of the equivalence of norms, uh, we actually needed to have certain uniqueness in the next theorem that I'm going to say. So, that, that would have, would have means that two norms are equivalent. And then, having that, we have theorem of Ostrovsky that says that the only absolute values up to that equivalence that we can uh, induce on Q uh, like either the periodic ones or either the standard ones, and that's all, okay? And, and what, what that can make us think, so what that can make us think is that we can basically think now about Q1 that, uh, that I already mentioned. And in this case, we actually know that the absolute value you can induce on the function field of that uh, geometric object are in one to one correspondence with the absolute values that it can be an, an, an easy exercise. So basically, we know that the points of C sum with the infinity, they correspond to uh, irreducible polynomials uh, of of the ring C of X. And there will be also one more, which will be corresponding like X. And we can check it's, it's like under undergraduate exercise level of difficulty that actually when we think about all the possible values we can induce of like on C of T, they will be exactly corresponding to those polynomials. Okay, and that exactly gives us the clue why set, I mean spectrum of that, so the set of all prime ideals of Z together with at some point of infinity can be thought of as arithmetic one is exactly because we can consider uh, the elements of a, like you can consider all the possible absolute values that you can induce up to the equivalence as the points of Q1. We have natural identification. By analogy of this, we, we basically have that both for, for Q1 and we have that like both for the time. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's exactly what, I, what, I, what I've just said. But here we can have the flag of a picture, so that's, that's our, like that's the keys of our arithmetic Q1. It looks basically like this. We can imagine it like this. It's, it's weird, but this is what it is. And, and yeah. yeah, so then we will be calling uh, those two in particular curves. Uh, so basically, geometric curve is something that we know we can just basically, for simplicity, just talk about projective curves, which is all we see. And, and in general, arithmetic curve will be a prime, uh, a set of prime ideals of a ring of integers, like together with infinite points. So in, in for general number field, will be like not just one infinite point, but several that 
exactly correspond to the possible and the links of our number field in to C. So those correspond to the roots of the polynomial, minimal polynomial that gives this final extension. <clears throat> so, so we have geometric kind of object and arithmetic object. And now we came to actually uh, see this mysterious object Adele. So here it's uh, the definition of Adele's in dimension one. So actually it's, it's a pretty big object. So um, what we do, so we have absolute values. And we, when we have absolute values on Q, we can uh, actually complete topologically Q with respect to those absolute values. So as we know, if we do that with respect to the Archimedean absolute value, the, our infinite point, then we actually get uh, R, we are used to that. But then when we do that with respect to a periodic absolute value, we are getting something that probably everyone heard of. Those are those just those, like, this is the ring of periodic numbers. <clears throat> so basically it's, it's really like nothing complicated. There is like no reason to be scared of. We, we can think of periodic numbers as, as really some kind of uh, power series. Uh -huh. <coughs> like that. So we basically see that from our definition of absolute values, when we take like, like the bigger power of P we take then this in the smallest neighborhood of zero with respect to our absolute values. So basically when we think of Oshi series with respect to this absolute value, we are going to obtain things like this. And also in each of those periodic numbers, there is this periodic rings of integers, and periodic of integers is just uh, those that have no negative terms here. So those are so-called, so like I learned yesterday, like Taylor expansions, so no poles. Okay. That's integral. Okay. So basically here, our condition is that if we take an adelic element, so it will be some kind of, I actually like to index our primes together with the infinite prime like by V. And so basically our condition is that AV belongs to our condition. Uh, at the place, but for all but finite too many places, they have to be integral. So almost all of those are integral. So we can even think that that we can basically to each such element we can like adjust like a divisor. Like we, we can like check the valuation of of each of such elements. And, and we have only five places where our divisor would be. And it's not that important. So now we're going to move to the Fourier analysis. So it's a bit more abstract setting, not the most abstract setting. It's just Fourier analysis on locally compact abelian groups. So if G is a locally compact then the G hat, uh, it's gonna be its group of characters. So by this, I mean continuous form of circle. And then we know that every locally compact group has a need after a positive constant half measure. That's already good. That means that we can integrate. Uh, and then we say that. Uh, a group is self dual if it's, if it's isomorphic to the group of its characters. Okay. And, and then there's this magic that actually all the local form 
field. Uh, it's local field, like any of it local, but it's actually self dual. And one can uh, see that if we have, if we found that like, one non trivial character, then the, the isomorphism, the identification between uh, K and, I mean, between the field and, and the uh, characters. Characters in this take shift uh, by each element of our field. Is it the multi probative group you are considering or the additive group? That's additive. So basically, that may already look very much like kind of most classical Fourier analysis to everyone. So basically, here I'm a bit cheating, but in in the case of real numbers or Fourier transforms like this, like normally. Uh, somewhere here when we actually put an entry you have to when we are like in the finite extension so in case of number so we have to put some trace map there or if we take like c instead of r we also have to put some trace there. like maybe there is even a part but in general we have to get transformed for each local field which is of this form so in a common archimedean field like we can find a function which gives us a formula like this and then each of them will uh, satisfy the inversion formula, uh, which is the same thing from our set of R measures. We can take one which, which gives us this formula. And then, uh, in general, we can then take product of all like of this all theories and product of all those local Fourier transform that gives us actually global Fourier transform. And then we can see that like K actually sits in our adults discreetly. I would say that it's definitely a subset it's because it sits naturally in each of its condition and, and its dual is actually like a quotient of adults by itself. And basically, that Fourier analysis was like I already mentioned this by John Tate, who actually found a new proof of, of Hecke's analytic continuation of functional equations for zeta functions. But that's actually not what we are going to talk about. So we actually want to show how to get Riemann Roth theorem. So Tate actually got Riemann Roth theorem directly from Poisson's summation formula for this theory. Uh, we can basically rewrite it a bit differently. So how we write it, we basically, for each place, we take uh, the following function, which is kind of like almost the eigenfunction of our Fourier transform. And for those, we define sort of size of cohomology. So it's difficult to define the like, cohomology uh, in the arithmetic case, but we can define size of cohomology and it will work both for arithmetic and geometric case. So basically, one has to believe like that if we take integral of those functions, it's actually gonna give us the right thing. So this, this function, the quotient, it looks a bit weird, but it's defined in the right way. You just have to believe me. And, and then you can get all the characteristics in exactly this way. And then, if we introduce our notation in this way, we actually get, uh, we can read very easily, you have to trust me, what is the value of this Euler characteristic. So basically, uh, for each element, I think I, I basically didn't say it. it must have been on the previous slide. So basically, there are elements which are like almost every one, and our primary independent faces non-trivial and those will be in one-to-one -one correspondence with divisors. It must have been somewhere in the previous slide. And then the alpha is basically divisor associated to such alpha. And then uh, the other characteristics of the alpha will be exactly um, something like this. And then one can basically check that in the geometric case, we get those values that I just written, which already look very familiar. 
to people who like the mother of the land. And then, what did I say? Anyway, uh, so Riemann-Roch theorem will be obtained very easily uh, from, from this statement because we know that so basically T1 is basically just zero divisor uh, in our notation. And then we actually obtain something else as duality, but says duality can be get like the full statement of the Riemann-Roch theorem we are obtaining exactly from Fourier analysis that we have. So so yeah, but that's that's a really cool formula, right? So basically, we get all the characteristics as like one integral over adults of eigenfunctions of Fourier transform. That's that's super beautiful. And yeah, and now just quickly to dimension two, we actually uh, managed to generalize it to dimension two. That was very problematic. So after Tate did his his work on Adele's, everyone was like very hopeful to generalize it to higher dimension, but it's actually higher adults, they, they, they are very complicated. It's not possible to define measure like this is very big. And, and yeah, so here basically I, I'm just talking about the geometric object with what we are dealing with. So basically in dimension two, yeah, again, as, as the elements of our, of our arithmetic object we just take like prime ideals of some rings and then we have to add like ribbon service as infinity it will be like two dimension two dimensional uh, analogy of this infinite point in dimension one and it will look basically like this so so basically one to basically that on the left for example we have um uh Elliptic curve, then over zero, or over zero, we have this elliptic curve with coefficients in Q. Any other fiber is elliptic curve with coefficients in the final field, like, uh, and then at infinity, we have like ribbon surface given by the same uh, equation. Okay, now very briefly. So, in dimension two, so basically on the right hand side, we have like one dimensional picture. So, we have Adele's, and we had like this discrete. Uh, field that was our one dimensional global field and in dimension two we'll have like more important of like this kind of crucial object we have a then bc and we have k so k will be the function field of our geometric object and b and c will be uh, some subspaces which correspond uh, uh, so b corresponds to curves on our surface c corresponds to points on our surface and basically what we can get uh, that the Euler characteristics in dimension two will be something like this. So basically, we'll have this kind of a bit more complicated formula, but maybe you don't see, but it's sort of like almost very cool. I mean, it is very cool because it's quite nice integral representation, but it's almost something like a uh, blob. We should have C, but then in our theory, sometimes when things are well defined, but they are not in this case, we can decompose such a quotient integral into um, like A. Oh, this was A This be right. Something like that. Here, of course, we have like, and this is like some kind of like alternating sum, which is like very much Euler characteristic, like, but the object we are taking here are like completely different. So it's actually weird that we have something like this, but also very beautiful. I mean, it's something that we certainly didn't expect. So so yeah, in the arithmetic case, the only problem is that that yet yeah, that we get certain at this point of infinity, we get kind of this Gaussian function that is supposed to give us something like metric, the metric that comes from like metrized sheaves in oracle of geometry, and we still kind of don't, don't know how to how it compares to oracle of geometry or so that's still Thank you. Thank you.
questions? So, um, do I understand right that this Euler characteristic would traditionally be defined in terms of a PAL or LI cohomology, and you're giving an analytic expression for it? I'm actually, this is the formula for, for the kind of Zariski cohomology Euler characteristics. So basically, it's well known that the cohomology of Adels, like just the scheme part, gives Zariski cohomology. And, and what we do here, certainly, like if you just do it for the geometric surfaces, so what you get is it's just like the same thing as the alternating sum of dimensions of cohomologies. Get it this way. And those functions will be certain characteristic functions, so associated to like kind of local fields. So they really will count the this like they will be shifted by the device. They will be really counting the right thing. So it's very easy to see it in dimension one, which no one has time. I, I did those explicit calculations. What we will get as those norms be like some Q to the. What I'm asking is it's much more elementary. I'm I'm just asking. This electrochristic has a previous definition in terms of a cohomology theory, which is well established. Yes, it's and you're giving a, a new yes, expression for it, exactly, which is analogous in the smooth case to like the the, the uh, TSC theorem. Or uh, I I would not go that far because. This is uh, oh, okay, so this is just like we do it just for surfaces, so it's like far simpler than like RTS. Okay, what would be the analog, let's say, for complex surfaces? This, form this is what I was saying. Like you just calculate the the standard Zariski cohomology groups mm -hmm. and take the alternating sum of dimensions of those groups. So, but that's how it would be defined, right? That's how it would be defined. The other characteristic is defined that way, but you're getting a formula for it. Which is different from the way it's defined. Yes. So, in the case of usual complex surfaces, what is that formula? You have the alternating sum of the dimensions of the cohomology is equal to some analytic. So, but this is what I was saying those functions. Mm -hmm. So, for each local place, you will have characteristic functions mm -hmm. of shifts of some uh, integral, uh, yeah, integral ring of the local. Shifted exactly by, by by the divisor at that point. Okay, uh, thank you. Any more questions? Thank the speaker again. Thank you.